Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hordup with week two of his message, Worship, Responding to God's Truth with Loving Obedience. So I, I want to begin today, and I, and I um, asked Sarah to help me because my penmanship is terrible. But we've been singing praises to God. And every song that we, that we uh, have focused on this morning has been a song that describes God's holiness. Is there a kid's church today? No, okay. See, it was good. I didn't remember the release. <laughs> so I want to finish the sentence. Sarah's going to write on top of that page. She's going to write, God is. And um, I know we've done this before, but it's important for us to see and do this again. So let's finish that sentence. I did say that. Pull it up like a left-handed person. I'm sorry. So God is. Someone finish it for me. God is what? Good. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. You don't have to write that all out. <laughs> God is what? Love. God is love. Forgiving. Forgiving. Mercy. 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 Faithful. Faithful. Holy. Holy and just. Uh, mercy. Faithful. Yeah. Mercy. Yeah, mercy. Just. Gracious. Gracious.
Hebrews 10, verse 25, it says, Let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let's encourage one another and all the more as we see the day of the Lord. I'm so thankful for what we've been part of us thus far in this day of seeing God's spirit move. And how that encourages us in our walk. Coming together for the purpose of worship is an act of obedience. I mean, it's an act of obedience. I mean, you ever get up on a Sunday morning and think, man, that church starts kind of early. <laughs> there are people that are still eating breakfast at 9.30 on Sunday morning. And I'm supposed to be in church. And we can find excuses not to get there, right? Sometimes. I mean, I'm a preacher. Sometimes it comes early. But in that act of obedience, when I come, it doesn't take very long. As I promise you, have a God, I need this. Something begins to happen and begins to stir, and God speaks to us, right? We need these times of coming together. We're doing this short series. I've been, I've been speaking to you a lot about allowing our worship to extend beyond the gathering. And it needs to do that. It needs to do that. I, I, I've been a person guilty uh, too often in my walk with the Lord of looking forward to the big gatherings because I find encouragement there. I'm kind of wrapped in an emotional way and, and I get a charge out of the gatherings. But the Lord speaks because he says, but there's more to your worship than just those gatherings. Those are important, but there's more. And that's what I've been speaking to us about, about extending our worship to go beyond just what we have, what happens on Sunday morning or at other appointed times. I want us to be followers of Christ who can understand that we can worship God in a, in a daily, intentional way. That as we do that, we will see God um, working within us, within our families, within our communities in a greater way. I believe it's true, church, that God wants to do so much more than what we see him do. But we sometimes limit that because God chooses to make his love known in this world, in this world through his followers. And sometimes because his followers are lacking in times of worship and listening to God, we miss out on what God's doing or we refuse to do what God is calling us to do. So I want to ask us today to consider this question Or this thought, how can we be effective in living out our faith if we are not deliberately prioritizing time to express our love and devotion to God who loves us? How can we be effective in being a follower of Christ that is having an impact within our family, within our communities, if we are not seeking to value God above all else? And I know I've talked a lot about intentional or deliberate times of worship. And sometimes people ask me, well, what do you mean by that? How should I do that? And then it, it might look different for many of us. But it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be something that's hard. Intentional worship is simply to give my complete attention to this time with God. To put myself in a position to pay attention, to listen to Him, and to speak things about Him that I know are true. So we finish the sentence that we've done before. God is. This is a way to begin an intentional time with God. We pick an intentional place that we protect in time, and then we begin to focus on God. And so you may take you may take one day of your, of your intentional time with God and take out a legal pad and begin to write things down. God is. And you may have a hundred things within a half an hour. And as you're writing things down that God is, God is, I can't see from behind it. So we write things down like God is good. And of course I have to finish that and say all the time, all the time, God is good. <laughs> we're going go down, God is loving, he's forgiving, he's faithful, he's full of mercy. And as you go through and you're, and you're writing those things down and saying them out loud, it's important that we hear ourselves declare truths of who God is. And as we go through that list that day, and we begin to write, we begin to realize, man, God of the universe loves me. And this is, these are his character traits and his qualities. 
And then we begin to see those things in Scripture. This, that's an intentional time with God. That's not something that's hard. It's something we can do. But we have to do it in a way that is where we're alert to it. Um, it's hard to have an intentional time with God if we don't fully embrace it as important. Think about how Think about when you were in school, maybe you're still in school, of, of what you have to do to be effective in study. I've never been one who can be very effective in my study if I'm sprawled out at a recliner laid back with, with uh, the TV on and the stereo on and everything else and trying to focus on a thing. I've never been effective in that way. That's not giving myself over to paying attention. Same is true when we spend intentional time with God. We need to, to find that place in which we know that we can listen and pay attention most to what God has for us. And we need to protect that. We can, we can build that. So let's say you make a list of all the things God is. Then you can build on the trait. So maybe the next week, you want to build on the trait that God is forgiving. So you begin to search through your Bible and, and find different examples of God being forgiving. Or maybe you focus it and you, and you begin to write those things down and focus and pray those things through and learn from them and let God speak to you. Or maybe you're going to focus on the fact that God is merciful or that he is righteous. Whatever it may be. See, we, one beginning list that is kind of broad, can be, we can narrow it down over and over, and pretty soon we can find that that one, one day when we were intentional to write some things down has, has, has worked out now several days, if not weeks. We'll find that God is doing something in us and that he is shaping us. So how can I, what are those, those things I can do? And I'm not, I'm not saying we need to do hard things. I'm saying it's a little, some simple things I can do to be intentional and deliberate in my worship with God. Psalm 96, 9 says this, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. I think about that, man. I'm called to worship God in the splendor of his holiness. Wow. How do I understand that? When we come before God and we begin to declare and we begin to see who he is and how and, and, and try to grasp a little bit of what it means that God is holy, we find that it begins to do a work within us and it begins to cultivate within our hearts um, this desire to move toward, toward being the whole person God has created us to be. Helps us to be more aware of how beautiful God's holiness is and how much in need I am of that holiness and the truth of that. And I'm reminded that God is God. He is he is the one who made everything. He's created the heavens and the earth. He's made you and I in his image. He's over all these things. God doesn't need, doesn't, doesn't really need me to worship him. He gave me life. But I know this, I sure need to worship him. I sure need to value him. When I declare that he is God, it does something to me. I cannot reflect and follow um, God's character traits if I'm not valuing him first and foremost in my life. In Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, a young Isaiah, in a time of worship before God, has this vision and this encounter that is from God. And this encounter shapes him. This encounter calls him to respond and to proclaim the name of the Lord to a people in need of hearing the truth. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah has this wonderful, beautiful vision of these heavenly creatures and they're declaring the glory and the holiness of God. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. 
Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He is being completely aware with everything that's happening around him that God is holy and pure and mighty and powerful. And becomes aware of his condition. He says, but I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips. There is a problem of sin in my life. And one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand that he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and he said, see this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. He said, go and tell this people. I want to stop right there for a few moments and think about what is happening in this, in this passage. Isaiah has this vision, and in the vision he sees the power and the might and the beauty of the holiness of God. For me, when I read this passage, it reinforces for me the importance of having this time where I'm really seeking God and valuing Him more than anything else. He becomes very aware of His presence and how holy God is. And he says, I have... I have a need for God to work in my life. Pastor Jack Haper has written, The holiness of the Lord is a trait that means he is complete and cannot lose that completeness. So holiness is closely related to the word wholeness. The beauty of the wholeness of God has to do with all that makes him holy. In God's holiness we find completeness, perfection, order, and unity. When we come to God and we, and we worship Him and we acknowledge who He is and our need for Him and our desire to, to, to value Him more than above all else in our life, we find that, that He works in us. We find that there will be seasons where we will have to repent and, and, and confess things that are wrong and seek to restore us to a right relationship with we will find that as we grow in Him, He works in our lives and He moves us to becoming more whole. To becoming more of who He's shaped us to be. We will find as we worship God, we begin to change the way we think about Him. We will find that our love for God will stir within us a deeper love for others. Does anyone, uh, and Jack says, you know, in, in God's holiness we see completeness, perfection, order, and unity. You know, I think about things like in, in when God created the heavens and the earth, and, and he created man, and says, and all that God did was good. It was complete. I think about when Jesus went to the cross for my sins, and he, he suffered and died, and he lived this life without sin. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. She's saying it is done. It is complete. Because all that was defeated. Because Jesus rose again. And he's coming back. And he has a place for us. And that place for us is wrapped up in the love of who he is because he has done everything for us. Has anyone ever worked one of those jigsaw puzzles? I mean, the real ones. Not like the ones that I can do. Like, Hundred pieces. <laughs> Has anyone ever worked those ones that have like thousand pieces or fifteen? Yeah, okay, you're one of those people. Anyone else do those puzzles? I know there's got to be. Okay, there's some back there. There's some. You guys are amazing. <laughs> because I mean, here's how I do them. That color is close. <laughs> jigsaw puzzles. And some of them are just incredibly huge. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. How do they do that? We well, you know, you know, you get the puzzle and, and, and on the box is this, this picture. And the picture is never something with very definite 
colors, you know, this is red, now this is green. It's always all these various shades that are all kind of similar, right? And they have all these different pieces that fit, and you have to orient the pieces correctly to one another, and they all work within the framework, and use this picture to try to guide you. And everything has to be in the right relationship. And when it's done, you have this finished picture that reflects the image that you have on the cover of the box. You have this finished picture that reflects usually some, some artist's work from some painting or some, some, some uh, beautiful photograph that was taken. And that puzzle reflects that image. It's not a perfect reflection of the image because you can see where the pieces all come together. You see all the lines and everything. But it reflects that image. See, God, when we worship God, who is holy, who is pure, who is complete, who brings order to our life, who brings unity to the body of Christ, and, and we know that he is holy, he calls us to be holy. And as we learn to walk in him, and as we learn to grow in our relationship with we begin to reflect him more and more. And we're not perfect, but we can reflect his holiness. And people can look at us and they'll say that they are reflecting who God is. They're not perfect. I can see, I can see the lines where they've been shaped and brought together. I can see imperfections, but they're nonetheless reflecting the image of Christ. Isaiah, his vision is overwhelmed by the beauty of the holiness of God. And he can only respond that I am ruined. A man of unclean lips. He knew he could do nothing about the sin problem in his life. He knew that the people were ruined, that there was no solution for the sin problem. Isaiah was able to express things about God. He was able to see things about God, but in doing so, he said, there is an alignment problem. There's a problem with my reflecting God's holiness. And as he expresses that, and he is remorseful of that, he is, he is touched with, this, with, with, the, with the touch of God, with the fire of God. And he says, your sin has been atoned for. And as Isaiah is made aware of God's holiness, he says, I the sin problem has to be taken care of, and God atones for it, and God has given us an atonement for the sin problem in our life. And we must live as followers of Christ who know that. That means we must live as followers of Christ who are willing to say, hey, I follow Christ and I'm seeking to reflect Him, but I know right now there's something wrong. You ever seen a beautiful jigsaw puzzle, like 1,500 pieces, and it's all done, and there's a piece missing? <laughs> that bothers you, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, or you get all done, you have it all put together, it's your first time, and there's a piece missing. <laughs> I'm getting all kinds of confessions, but... <laughs> but that piece missing shows that there's... There's a problem, there's something, there's a piece that needs to be there. Sometimes, if we're reflecting God's holiness, if we allow sin to get a hold in our life, and we're unwilling to confess it and deal with it, that reflection begins to lose pieces. And what begins is one piece that isn't able to reflect God's holy, holiness will move into two or three or four. If we refuse to confess that and to move forward, allowing Christ to shape us. Isaiah was aware of God's holiness. I'm a sinful man. God atones for sin and he restores him. And God asks the question, who will go? Who will go and share the truth of who I am with my people? Who will go? And Isaiah says, I will go. He doesn't, doesn't say that he, that he is incapable. doesn't say he doesn't know what to say. He just says, I will go. I will obey you, Lord. I will go. That's the obedience part. That's the part where we as followers of Christ, as we come before God, and he says, I want you to reflect my holiness. He says, will you go? Will you share my truth? Will you dare to do this? Will you follow me?
God restored him, atoned for his sin. I pray that he's a, that you've accepted the atonement he's made available for you. Our worship is not intended to be just between us and God. Our worship, our seeking to make God and value the most in our life requires that we respond in obedience. The call of the Lord is who will go for me. So we need these personal times of worship to listen to him when we need these corporate times with the body of Christ. Then we need to be obedient and say, I will go, Lord. My love for you, Lord, is, is spurring out with, within me a love for others. I mean, the greatest commandment is to know the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as we worship him and value him above all else, we're reminded of second to love our neighbor as ourself. When we intentionally worship our focus on and we focus on God, we become very aware of where we are in light of who God is. We become aware that God's holiness is not is not something that should intimidate me or make me say I can't even go in his presence. God's holiness is, is something that should attract us to God. And we should say, I want to go to that holiness because God has done things. He's atoned for my sin. He came and he lived, he died, and he rose again. That I can come before him and I can find forgiveness in who Christ is. And he will shape me so I can reflect attributes that are Christ-like. In 1 Peter, Peter talks about, he talks a lot about the body of Christ the first couple of chapters of 1 Peter, he talks about um, being holy. And he's talking about being intentional in our walk and understanding how God has shaped us. And I just want to read a couple of things here uh, before we close in prayer. He says in, in chapter 1 and verse 3, if you're using the Red Pew Bible, this, this is on like, uh, 1177. Chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. He's talking about the completeness of God. And he's, he's being mindful as we come before him in worship, we should be mindful that God has given us everything we need through Christ. And he talks about how that's protected and, and, and how great that work is. <laughs> then he talks about how God has created us to, to be holy and reflect that holiness. And I would encourage you this week to, to read through that chapter. But then in chapter 2, he says this. Verse 1, he says, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, and hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by you may grow up in your salvation. And I picture this, Peter's saying, he's saying, you know, when you come before Christ who is holy, be willing like, be willing like Isaiah. Oh man, Lord. As I'm declaring and I'm remembering and I'm worshiping and lifting up who you are, you're showing things to me that I need to deal with. That I need your forgiveness from. That I need to move forward and away from. And he says, he says, we should stir within us this craving. Have you ever seen a baby that didn't tell you when they were hungry? They tell you when they're hungry, man. He said, we should crave, we should crave spiritual milk like newborn babies. In my spiritual life, I know when I'm hungry. I know it. I know at any time with the Lord. I think you do too. We know it. But there, there's always that temptation to, to fill it with something else. But we know it. So we must seek Him. We must be obedient. When we know it, we must come before Him and seek that spiritual fulfillment. Then Peter talks about, talks about the church. In verse 4, he says, As you come to Him, the living soul, he's speaking of Jesus, that was rejected by men, but chosen by God to be precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, 
be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice and acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter's saying, look, this is Jesus Christ who's the foundation for everything. He's what we, we, we build our life upon. Jesus Christ is who we seek to reflect in our life and grow and become more like him. And he says, we as followers of Christ are being built into a spiritual house. That's a sobering thought because that means that my walk with the Lord affects the, can affect others' walk, others in the body of Christ who are walking as well. <coughs> we grow together. It means sometimes we, we, as we grow together, it means we, we don't have a, we can't just ignore things. We must work and encourage one another as we grow in this walk. It means I must understand that, that my sin is never just about me, but it can affect the body. The same is true. My growth is not just about me. My growth affects others whom I can walk with and encourage them to grow as well. So today I want to pray with you. We're about to start a series in a couple of weeks that will focus on these things and more. And I would just and I would ask that you would that you would pray and be willing to allow God to shape you and to see the value of the body of Christ in a new way. We stand here and able and let's pray. Father, today I pray that, that you would continue to move in our hearts. Lord, I, I'm so I'm so blessed to see and to know that your Holy Spirit is moving. To know that there are, are young people, men and women of, of a variety of ages and places in life who are willing to, to publicly declare, I need, I need more of God's working power. Father, I, I pray that as we think and as we seek you this week, that we would be your followers of Christ who who are seeking and craving you. Who are willing to say, Lord, help me to reflect who you are. And Lord, where I don't, help me to be willing to, to, to turn what is keeping me from being made into your likeness. Help me to be submitted to your will and working in my life. Father, help us to be, to be faithful as we follow you, our faithful Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for your presence in this place. Help us this week as we come before you in those deliberate times to have good, focused time with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.